Hello, friends. This is Craig Perra from themindfulhabit.com, and you're listening to Sex Afflictions and Porn Addiction, a podcast uh, dedicated to helping you do two things, create a great life and create healthy sexuality. This is not just for addicts, people in the throes of addiction, although a lot of you are in that space, it's for men and women who want to elevate themselves, who want to operate on that higher plane. And we have someone here today who is operating on that higher plane, a gentleman who's taken a similar path to mine who I absolutely love. We have Matt Dobshoots from PornFreeRadio.com. And I was on his podcast and uh, people uh, you know, keep hearing that and keep calling me because of that. And I wanted to have him on. Welcome, Matt. Thanks, thanks, Craig. Uh, yeah, we did take a similar path. We. We're both in corporate America. We both. Ooh, are, ooh, we, I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm and, having flashbacks. I'm having flashbacks. And we both left, um, not totally by our own design. And, Mine was exclusively not by my own design. <laughs> for the record, they asked me to leave, and security was present. Just so we're on the same page. I, I bike commuted the day I went to work, and um, I had to take an Uber home because I had a box and I had the bike. <laughs> oh, oh, I mean, that's almost like a meme. That's almost like a meme, like the guy who just got fired on his bike carrying the box. I know. It was hilarious. Um, but you know what? That day I drove home, it was the most beautiful day of the summer. And it was 1030 in the morning, and my building was made of glass. And the Uber drove me around the backside of the building, and the sun was shining off the building, and I was I never went in that building again. It was like, it was like I was it was like the the heaven's gates opened up or something, and I just was exiting. It was the most beautiful scene. Then I got home and I was alone and had to find a uh, an old Nokia uh, candy bar phone because uh, they took my smartphone when I left. <laughs> and uh, but I put my you know I I moved on from there. So, so you've got a very popular podcast on pornfreeradio.com. I know it's kicking ass on iTunes. Hundreds of thousands of people are listening to your message on healthy sexuality, being a good Christian, and, and navigating this minefield of healthy sexuality in a hyper hypersexualized society as a Christian. And I work with a lot of Christian men, so I'm so glad you're here. Matt, but I want to first talk about you and, and that moment where you went into work that day and they said, hey, man, this is it. Um, you were underproducing. Um, tell, tell us about what brought you to that place and the impact that your sexuality or your expression of it. And notice, I like to use those words beyond the addiction label. And the reason why, Matt, we've talked about this because so many guys are out there am I addicted? And they're filling out the questionnaires and they're answering the questions and they're reading and they're researching. No, I'm not. Yes, I am. And they're fighting with their partner back and forth. Stop it. Is this healthy? Is, is, are you proud of your sexuality? And so that's just why I'm using that language. Bring me back. Bring me back to that place, please. Well, the, the, my layoff or my exit really was about me going on a different path. I had started the podcast and I had started doing, uh, creating content for guys who struggle. And I, I think that my company, I think saw us, you know, some of the stuff that I was doing and, and, um, and maybe, maybe in some ways I gave, maybe in some way my passion had shifted as a manager, as a leader. And, um, they were very kind and, and gave me a nice package. And I had been there 10 years in marketing, but it was really about moving on. Now, I think one thing I, I've been thinking about a lot lately is when I was in pornography, when I was in the addiction, how did that affect my career? And I think it undermined my confidence. And so I wasn't good at advocating for myself. I wasn't, I had never been, a, I was never a manager when I was in porn. I never was a, seen as a leader. Um, I was definitely an underperformer when I was in the addiction. 
And, and I like how you're talking about the impact, Matt, because, you know, and, and, and you get this too. People call you and they want to they wanna share their story and everybody's got a story and you've heard the same story hundreds of times, right? I was exposed to pornography as a child. And for you men who are listening and who have called me and said these things, this isn't taking away, but you know the next question that I asked you if you called. And if you call, this is the question I'm going to ask you. So be prepared for it. So you hear the same story. I was exposed to porn as a child. Um, I was raised in a home where sexuality was shamed. How often do we hear that? Or, and, or not, not talked about. Or not talked about, right. Complete, shamed completely or not talked silent. About. Completely silent. And I had to find my way. And I found my way that brought me down this dark path. And here I am now consumed. I self-identify as a porn addict. And then I asked the question, um, you know, so what? They go, what, what, what do you mean, so what? I'm, I'm talk, calling you. I've got a problem. I say, so, so, so uh, look at the data. Billions of people are watching porn. Their lives aren't crumbling. Um, what's the impact? I want to know about the impact. And you just talked about the impact. Tell me a little bit more about when you were in that place. Um, and, 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 and it, yeah, we'll start first. Tell me a little bit more about when you were in that place, that impact that you were just talking about, and then your experience in working with Christian men. So let's start with you first, please. Well, the first thing that really impacted me the most was I had a mistaken belief that I got in childhood that I was unlovable. And when porn came along as a little eight-year-old guy, I saw something that was overwhelming, exciting to me. Awesome. Awesome, numbing. And that sense of being not good enough, unlovable, was, was muted by this incredible energy that came from the porn. And so I felt, I mean, as soon as I saw porn, I knew it was something I wanted uh, to see more of. And you, know, you talk about me being a Christian. I was raised in a Christian home. I knew that there was um, a piece of this that wasn't, it's not that it was just sexuality, um, but I knew there was an unhealthy piece to this. And maybe it was part of my moral core or the way I'd been taught, but I knew there was something un unhealthy about it. But as I said, it wasn't talked about in my house. So, so you, I, you, were, you, let's stay, stay on that for a second, Matt. So, yeah. important. so you, you fall into the category of not talked about where I fell into the category where it wasn't talked about it when it came up. It was clearly a dirty and disgusting thing. And here's my favorite one, right? Cause this is such, it sure. just makes me laugh. It's sex is dirty and disgusting, and you save it for someone you love when you're married. Right. Like, think about that for a second. My, my parents talked a lot about healthy sexuality. They modeled it. They were strong Christians. They, were, they really were open. But here is the, th here is the one conversation I remember. I'm at the dinner table, and my dad at the time worked with uh, – mechanics. He sold tools to mechanics. And so he was going to Harley Davidson dealerships and kind of these rough places. Yeah. yeah, That's a, and, that's a tough, that's a tough crowd. Pinups on the wall, that yeah. kind of stuff. Men, and, men. Right. So I, I don't know how it came up, but we talked about at the Harley Davidson dealership, they had some of these motorcycle magazines with topless women in it. And, and I think I had even maybe looked at one and maybe my dad saw me. And so they were talking about it. And it was interesting. I was really interested. My dad was talking about it. And my mom turns to him and she said, well, you never would look at one of those magazines, would you? Kind of shaming my dad. My dad is prone to be a little silent. He just got all quiet. So the, the only message I got as a young boy was, well, this must be the shame, most shameful thing in the world to look at one of these magazines. And my dad's silent. So that was the last conversation I ever had about it until, believe it or not, about 25 years later, 30 years later, when I'm recording Porn Free Radio and my dad starts listening to it. And then he's like, hey, can we talk about some of the stuff you're talking about? Like, um, oh, not because not because he's struggling, but he yeah, never no. knew. 
It's, it's, I feel it in my heart. What a nice bonding time for you and your father. What was that conversation like? Well, here's the crazy thing. I just recorded episode seven and it was called what my dad uh, told me about pornography. And the answer was nothing. And so it kind of laid him out a little bit. Mm. He told me he listened to that episode. And here's what he said, Craig. When I was listening to the episode, I started thinking about my dad. He goes, I wasn't even thinking that the dad in the story was me. I started thinking about what did my dad tell me? What did my, how did my dad miss me? What, what, did, what information did I not get growing up? And so he realized he was just like me. He was like a boy wanting dad to speak into this area of his life. And he had the same gap that I had. So it actually was a very powerful connection when he, when he finally listened to that episode. That is so, so beautiful. And I just want to pause for a commercial break right now. And I want to just say this. This is the commercial, brothers, fathers. If you do not talk to your kids about this issue, you are affirmatively fucking them up. I am sorry to use that blunt language, but you just, I just, I'm all crying over here listening to your story. It's so moved by it, brothers. It's hard. It's not a conversation you're prepared for. So in your life, when you've had to have conversations that you're not prepared for, what do you do? You prepare. You reach out to Matt. You go on my website. You research, how do I talk to my kids about this in a healthy way that isn't going to leave them 20 years down the road paying us to help them in having this conversation. Commercial break, over. Thank you, Matt. What a story. What a story. It has been good. I mean, literally... You know, in the last couple of years, uh, there's been a lot more conversation about what happened to me, what the experience was, um, you know, some definitely my dad. My dad said to me, I was in such a place of unknowing. I didn't know how to talk to you about stuff. I didn't know. You know, he, he, told, he was a campus pastor when I was really young. And this is in the 70s. And a guy came to him and said he was struggling with porn. And my dad just, he, he kind of knew about magazines, but he didn't know that someone could be addicted or he didn't know how to help him. And he said, it wasn't until he heard my podcast that he realized, oh my gosh, Matt has the same thing that that guy in 1975 had. Like, and he realized he just didn't know. He didn't know how to, he, he didn't know about it. And then he didn't know how to help me, even if he did know about it. So even when he found out about it when I was in recovery, he didn't know how to speak into it. So this curse that you bore for so many years and had such an impact, um, you've turned it into a blessing. You've turned it into a gift that you're sharing with other people. Tell me about that realization when you were at rock bottom and, and how you found yourself to this place here, touching so many people's lives. Hmm. Well, I mean, I had a couple of rock bottom experiences. The, one of the first ones was when my wife of just under two years found me masturbating and looking at porn. And she had no idea that I had brought this into the marriage and, you know, she thought it was something in the past that maybe I'd kind of dabbled with, had no idea that it was a regular thing hiding, lying, all the things that would go along with covering uh, an addiction. So that, that was one night that was just a, kind of a rock bottom experience. I had another one too. Um, the first time after about 30 days, after a tearful confession, my wife went out of town and I was, I tried to fill up my night with busyness and it gets to about midnight, and I think about an old modem that I had in the basement that was broken. My wife took our family modem with her on this tra trip, but I think about the old broken one. So I go downstairs and obsessively for about an hour and a half, I piece together this old modem, and, and within about 90 minutes, two hours, you You're know, on. It, it connects to the internet. And... I, it was so scary. And you remember the old modem? Remember how it went? Yes. When I heard it handshake and connect, I jumped back and I was at the threshold of my office and I'm looking in 
And I remember the Yahoo browser popped up. This is the old days. Yahoo pops up and the cursor is blinking in the search box. And I could hear my heart beating. It was like, ba-boom, ba-boom, ba-boom. And I had all those lies came to me, you know, like you've already screwed up. You told your wife you wouldn't be on the internet. You've already screwed up. Just go for it. She's gone. She's not going to be back. She's in San Francisco. She's not going to be back for three days. Go have a party. But I was so scared. And I had this moment of insanity almost. I, I, I thought for a second, if I could get into the computer, rip out the modem and with a hammer or something and break it, I could be free that night. And so that's what I did. I ran in the kitchen. I grabbed a hammer. I ran back to the thing. I didn't even unplug the computer. I ripped open the computer. This is the old style where it was plugged in, ripped out the card. I could have electrocuted myself. I pulled this thing out and I start beating the, the shit out of it. You know, I just, and it, man, that thing is hard to break too. It's hard plastic. It's all those, you know, it's probably in a landfill somewhere now, but so I thought for a second, wow, freedom, victory, I did it. And then I had what can only be considered either a panic attack or a, an encounter with darkness. All of a sudden, I felt like there was an evil presence in my house. I turned on every light in the house. I went from room to room and didn't feel safe in any room. I called my wife. She prayed for me on the phone and she said, if you don't feel safe, you know, you just need to go to your brother-in-law's house and just sleep on the couch. And I hung up the phone with her. I was, I had tears in my eyes and I felt I didn't feel safe. And I ran out of the apartment four in the morning and rang, rang my sister and brother-in-law's doorbell. And they're the great, they're great kind of people. They didn't ask questions. I just laid on the couch. My brother-in-law went back with me the next night and all the lights were still on. Everything was fine. I never had an experience like that again. But what was it? What was that? What, 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 or even maybe not necessarily what was that, but that moment obviously is one of significance to you. Matt. And, and, I'm, you know, and I'm thinking, and you know when we're talking, we know people are listening to our stories. And, and you get in this place where, at least me, where I kind of take for granted. I talk about this every day. There's no shame. You want to learn about everything about me. You go online. But sometimes when we're talking to someone and they're stuttering and they're, they're, they're trying to get the words out or they hang up once, they hang up twice, I need to remind myself. That some people have never, ever, ever communicated these feelings and thoughts to anyone. And I know so many people have been in that place feeling that dark presence. What did that mean to you? Here's, here's what it was. It something was at stake here, right? This wasn't just a little childhood dalliance. This was at my core. And when I, when I destroyed that modem that one night, and that wasn't my only battle, my only victory, when I destroyed that modem, whatever it was inside me or outside of me, if it's in the spiritual world, whatever it was, just, I mean, it, it just exploded. And, um, and, and, you know, I mean, Christian guys, a lot of times use battle language or the fight. And I don't know. I don't really like that sometimes, but that night I was in a fight. Yeah. I was in a fight with something that really had a hold of me and it was still early. It was 30 yeah. days in. I had yeah. just, you know, 30 days before I'd been crying to my wife and apologize and say, I'll never do this again. And there I am standing at the door, the doorway thinking I'm going to do it. And then when I, when I said no to it, it was like everything in me, everything in my apartment just kind of collapsed. And, and, um, and so that's when I got serious. I went to a recovery group right after that. I, I, I realized I couldn't do this on my own because I didn't know anybody like me at the time. I didn't know anybody who would rebuild a computer to get on the internet. What a story. You know, I didn't know. I, you know, I, I, I remember me and my wife were very open. Yeah. I think you and your wife might've been like this too, but we, you know, we told people in our church group and you know, the other guys all looked at me like, what are you talking? Like, even if, even if I did do that, I wouldn't talk about it, yeah. you know? And so it's like, I felt so alone, 
So I finally, I went to this recovery group and it wasn't the greatest recovery group, but people were honest there. And the, the leader uh, just had a lot of empathy and, and I just, and it just started to click. Like this is a, this is bigger than just a little, this is bigger than just a little fascination, a little something about porn. It's about feeling unlovable. It's about this core wound from childhood that I carried with me. It was about the silence that was in my family about this and how my dad didn't speak into my life. You know, it was all those things together. I love what you said about your discomfort with the battle language. And while there are certainly points in our lives where there is a battle and we are fighting, and sometimes literally in my experience, there was times when I felt I was fighting for my life because I did try to kill myself at one of my lower moments. The long-term challenge in using that language I found is thou will start giving it too much power. The more you, the more you demonize and pedestalize and, 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 and battle and fight and war, the more power this becomes. Tell me your discomfort with that language, because I think this is an important lesson for my brothers. Well, I, I know exactly why I'm discomfortable with it. Here, here's or uncomfortable with it. Here it is. I think a lot of porn use is tied to we're trying to take care of ourselves. It's unhealthy self-care. We're trying to make ourselves feel better. We're trying to make ourselves not feel pain. We're trying to be, feel good enough. So here's my problem with the battle language. If it's the enemy, porn, the battle, then what about those needs? What about those real needs, those hurts, those wounds, those places where you need self-care? And, and you, t you talk about me working with Christian guys. One of the main things I work with Christian guys to see, and I don't just work with Christian guys, but, but a lot of the guys I work with are Christian guys. I make them see that their needs are important, that they need good self-care. Because if you just demonize it, if you just make it the enemy, the big, you know, the, the devil horns, pornography, blah, yeah, yeah. just make it that, then what does the guy think? When I feel sad, when I feel um, any uncomfortable feelings, well, those must be bad because they always lead me to porn. So I don't want to feel. Matt, I, I love you, Matt. I am so enthralled with your message there. I, and I, I want you people out there listening to know is that I am not a fan of, uh, I, I think there are a number of flaws, particularly in the Christian community for dealing with this problem. It's demonized exactly the reason that Matt talked about. Matt is my number one guy, my number one referral source for people who call me and say, Hey, I'm looking for a Christian approach, Craig. I like your style. I like your action-oriented, goal-centric habits, mindfulness. Um, um, but I just, I, and, and for those of you who've been listening, I, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm a little cocky, maybe. Somebody have accused me of that before. Um, no. And, uh, yeah, yeah, no. no it's true. I, think, I think it was my wife, actually. I think it was my wife. Uh, but I need you to know that Matt is the bomb, the absolute bomb, because what he just said is freaking brilliant, freaking brilliant. You know, one of the questions I ask my guys, right? So people call me sometimes, Matt, just, and by the way, you are absolutely 100% correct. I want to make that crystal clear. And I agree with you wholeheartedly. I'm so glad you worded it that way. One of the curveball questions that I like to ask people is, I said, stop. I said, come on. Oh, it's so bad. And tell me all the good parts. Tell me all the positive attributes of pornography or, or even their compulsive sexual behavior. You know, prostitutes, massage. What? Wait, whoa, 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 whoa. What? What, what are you talking about, Craig? That's the most ridiculous question I've ever heard. How dare you? Sometimes there's a sense of umbrage. I said, tell me. And I said, well, you do it every day. Why do you do it? Well, it helps me escape. Sometimes I need, feel like I need to numb. 
Um, sometimes it feels like a warm security blanket when I'm having problems. Oh, so you're using it to deal with problems. Okay. I need touch. Um, I need you touch. Need, you need touch. I have a need for touch. Uh, connection. And, and, and then that list goes on. And, and so what, what starts with like, are you crazy? That's the dumbest question ever. They come up with this list. And I say, well, there's your list of unmet needs. Because all of your negative behavior is a function of your unmet needs. Get sure. those needs met. And you're going to be just fine. And I just love what you said. It's so, so. Uh, yeah. yeah. And, when, when the, and when the Christian guy goes into battle, he's battling with his needs. Right. And that's, that's where I lose the metaphor right there. And I, I try to never say it. Every once in a while, you can't help but use it because it's right. just every man's battle. Everyone says it. Yeah. I, 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 when I catch myself doing it, I cringe. I know. And, and there's a place for it, like you said. Sometimes when you're in that place and motivating and, 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 and uh, you know, fighting. But, but it's always, it's not fighting not to do something. If there's a fight in me, it's to live a great life. It's to be the best version of myself. So when did you decide to say, this is, I'm putting all my eggs in this basket? Because that is a very, very scary time when you say to yourself, you know what? And I remember it for me, Matt, when I stopped applying for jobs, when I, because I got fired, I got fired like you did six years ago, can't practice law in California, nobody's calling me back, couldn't even get a paralegal job when I was assistant general counsel for a $3 billion company. And, uh, and, but I'm moving in this direction. I'm feeling a connection. I'm helping people in ways that I was working with George Collins at the time. And he'd send me guys that he was struggling with and I'd be able to impact them. And I'm starting to feel this excitement and this is my calling and I'm sick and tired of keeping these secrets. I'm just going to tell everybody because I'm no more, no more, no more lies. I'm just going to start talking about it. And when I made that decision to stop applying for jobs, it was one of the scariest um, jumps that I've ever taken in my life. Do you have a moment like that? I, you know, I was kind of thinking about doing this full time. And so I got this package and I'm kind of strategizing with my wife, going to a couple friends in my life. And, um, uh, I sat down with this one guy, he's an entrepreneur, just a serial entrepreneur. And he, um, super positive. And he asked me this question. He said, did they give you a package? And he kind of said it in a somber way. And I said, yeah. And he goes, so they're funding your startup. You know, he's like, he's like, this is the opportunity. And I thought, you know, so I told my wife, I came home and I said, Let's do this. I mean, we got a nice runway here. Let's see if we can take off. And well, that's that's kind of how it started. What an amazing story. And, and yeah, and it's funny. I was working with one of uh, one of my early coaching clients. We're getting to the end. He worked with me like three months, and he did a great job. He really, you know, had some movement. And the last session I met with him, he said, "You know what? I'm glad you got fired." He goes, because there's no way you're going to be meeting with me at four o'clock in the afternoon to, to, to work with me for an hour a week. He goes, I needed help. And I'm glad you're there. And I, that's what he said. He goes, I'm glad you got fired. You know, I, I'm glad they, they laid you off. I'm glad too. Yeah. I, am, I feel truly blessed, Matt, that our lives have intersected and we've both taken a similar path and I have someone that I can talk to who's been there and can share um, some of the you know, more challenging parts of this journey. And it's so nice to have a friend. Tell me um, what you're doing now. How can guys get in touch with you? Tell me um, about your, you've got an online course, you've got a program. I want as many people to hear this. And you guys who've been listening, you know how like selfish I am and how, you know, come to me, come to me. But I got to tell you, there's a few well, listen, I think there's, there's, there's one person that I recommend um, on, the, um, on the Christian side, and, and that's Matt Dobschutz in Porn Free Radio. Doesn't mean there aren't other, other great people out there doing this work, but the way he has merged the science, the way he has merged the behavior, the, just what you heard about that battle stuff for all you fighters out there. Maybe there's an important place 
to um, to think of a different perspective. But um, let's let's hear it, man. Well, I mean, one thing that I identified right away, and I'm sure you you've seen this too, is guys have an intention to go porn free. They they kind of have an idea that it's a problem, but it doesn't go any more than an intention. They don't have a plan, and so. One of the first things I did was create a short course uh, called Your Porn Free Playbook that helps guys do the essential things that they need to build a plan, a strong recovery plan that's, that's focused on them. That, you know, because everyone gets hooked on porn for different reasons. Everyone goes to different things, has different weak points in their life. So a plan that is a one size fits all plan, I think is not going to fit at all. It's not going to work. But if you go through this course, it's just, it's the same thing I do with my paid coaching clients. I go through and I, we identify why are they leaving porn? What's the selfish reason that they have? Not, not because of their wife, not because of their job, not because of their religion, but what do they get out of being porn free? What's the thing that porn is robbing them of? Their confidence, their joy, what's missing? What do they get in recovery. Um, you know, I help them define a why. I help them define active commitments. I help them identify some of those triggers and obstacles, the mistaken beliefs like being unlovable. And then I, I walk them through how to connect with other people, that, that your plan is activated by people, not just a coach, not just your wife, but other men. And, and how do you build that network? And, you know, one of the most exciting things I've done this year Craig, is I went from just doing one-on-one -on -one coaching to doing some group coaching. And the coolest thing to see is the relationships between the men. Oh, I know. Because, Doesn't it feel so good? Because they look at us some, now, I'm going to tell you a story. This is a, a, a funny little anecdote from the early days of AA. Early days of AA, they used to do intervention calls, you know, couple of these guys in recovery, alcoholics, would go reach out to a guy who hadn't gotten sober yet. So one of these guys who had been sober for years, maybe 10 years, uh, takes a guy who's been sober for 10 days, and they go to, to a drunk's house to kind of, you know, do an intervention. So the, the guy who's been sober 10 years says, well, I did this, I did that, I did this, and I've gotten 10 years sober, and I haven't had a drink, and blah, blah, blah. And then the guy who's 10 days sober tells his story. Well, you know, a week and a half ago, my wife caught me with this, and I did this, and then I went to a meeting, and, you know, I've, I'm, I'm, by the grace of God, I'm here 10 days sober. The drunk turns to the guy who's been 10 days sober and said, how did you do it? The guy who's been 10 years sober, he's like, I, that, that's so unrealistic for me to even think about right now. But this guy was drunk a week and a half ago. All right, that's my people. I can talk to him. I want to know what he has to right. say. So here's the thing. When a Craig Perra gets on the line with you, when a Matt Dobschutz gets on the podcast, guys, guys love what we're saying. They agree with us. They relate to us. They empathize with us. But when they connect with some other guys who are in the process, not quite so far down the road of sobriety, and, you know, there's just amazing things that happen. You know, when they see a guy get to six months, they're like, oh, six months. That's something I, I can shoot for. That's something I can wrap my head around. Dude, I'm coming up on six years next month. Woohoo! You know, and – uh and it was a bad business trip. If I wouldn't have had that business trip, it'd be like eight or nine years. That's too much for people to yeah. wrap their head around right. when they're right. not getting three days, when they're right. not getting a week. Right. So when you get guys together and they're all on the same page, they're speaking the same language, rowing in the same direction, boom, that's when the magic happens. And the opposite, opposite of addiction is not sobriety, it is connection. And I'm with you. I love seeing the dynamic between my men on the group calls. Matt, how do people get in touch with you and where do they find you? Porn Free Radio is my central place. Pornfreeradio.com. That's the podcast. Coming up on episode 100 will launch January 2nd. Whoa. Um, 
So that's, I mean, gosh, if you want hours and hours and hours of this kind of talk, it's all there, including, I just counted, five episodes with the man, the myth, the legend, Craig Para. Uh, I don't know how you got into five episodes. Talk about, talk about not sharing a platform. How did that happen? I know. You, yeah. So, uh, but you got on five episodes. All of them were fun. And um, so that's the, that's the first place. You know, if you want to find me, Porn Free Radio is the place to start. Uh, it's on iTunes. It's on Google Play. It's on all the places where you can listen to podcasts. And, um, and from there, you know, um, pornfreeradio.com uh, slash playbook gets to my course. And, um, you know, that's, that's just an awesome thing to do when you want to go to that next level and create a plan. And a lot of my guys have connection. You know, a lot of my guys are in 12-step groups or they're in church groups, but they don't have any structure. These, these groups meet. Not, not so much the 12-step groups, but the, the church groups. They meet, they want to be porn free, but they just show up and basically report how they acted out with porn every week. There's no structure. So one of the things I do with my planning is I help guys get the structure. So if they have an accountability partner, they can make the relationship much more meaningful and, and actually hold each other accountable. You know, that, so. that is awesome. And, 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 um, this course that Matt created is awesome. It's awesome from one course creator to another. I know it's helping people. I know it's changing their lives. What I'm going to do, folks, is on my website, themindfulhabit.com, I upload all the podcasts to a blog. And um, then beneath that, I have some notes. And then beneath that is the transcript. In those notes, I'm going to put some links to these resources so you can access them. So you have another option that's going to help you become the best person that you can be. Because I don't care if you've been done for three days, three months, three years. This isn't about not doing something. This is about you becoming the best version of yourself. The sex and porn is the symptom. It's a mask. It is a cover. It is a solve for your wound, which another place where I'm precise agreement is that you are unlovable. There's a part of you that isn't good enough. And that's simply. I had, I had a client about two months ago say almost the same thing. He said, Matt, this is the salve. I learned early on that this, this made me feel better. And so I just rubbed it on. That's what, that's what he learned growing up. Pain comes up, negative emotions, it's the salve. Numb, cope, and escape. Numb, cope, and escape. Well, we have got to even that. that, that, that I, I want to have you on again, Matt. Um, we're going to stay in touch, obviously. Um, so, guys, Matt will be back um, soon. I'll keep you posted on that. But I just want to say to you, I see that tree behind you, and the, it's, it's Christmas. Merry Christmas, Matt. Thank you so much for being part of my life. Uh, for being there for me when I needed to talk and for um, doing what you do. Well, thank you, Craig. Love you. Love your guys. It's, it's, we're definitely, if, if it was a battle, we're brothers in the battle. We are brothers in the battle. That's for sure. <laughs> That's for sure. Keep up the good fight, my friend. And uh, thank you so much, everybody. I'll catch you next time. This is Craig Perra with Sex Afflictions and Porn Addictions. Check me out on iTunes, Google Play, subscribe to this podcast, and leave a review, too. Um, the podcast has changed a lot. And Matt, I, you got great reviews. I was reading yours, and I got a few back when I just started, and some guys were a little rough on me, and I think the podcast got a lot better because I got some great people training me and helping me um, blow this up. So uh, thank you, everybody. Have a Merry Christmas. Happy Hanukkah. Happy Holidays. Um, catch you on the flip side. Bye-bye.